He and Ivy, thank you so much for joining us to revisit some of the questions that were left after our uh, Seal Arise event. Um, the first question we have is, where can we get good local information about projected sea level rise and flooding in our communities? A lot of people want to know about data where they live. Yeah, that's a superb question. Um, th there's a, a plethora of different viewers that are out there, I guess, if you just Googled sea level rise viewers. But uh, the Maine Geological Survey has created one that's specific to Maine that uses the regional sea level rise scenarios that I described in, in the presentation. Um, if you just Google Maine sea level rise viewer scenarios, Maine Geological Survey, it'll come up. There's a, like I said, there's a bunch of other ones. That's a, that's a good one for getting a good sense of general impacts of sea level rise. Um, basically, it, it takes the highest astronomical tide or the highest predicted tide for the year uh, and superimposes all of those different sea level rises on sea level rise scenarios on top of it uh, and does what we call bathtub flooding so basically it just floods you know statically the land surface so if the land surface is below the water it just shows a different color um, you can only zoom in to a certain point because uh you should still be able to see you know a, pro a specific property or something but we don't want people trying to zoom right in all the way on their house to see if like the front of their driveway is wet or, you know, things like that. Cause it's just a, a general planning tool. Um, that that's a great tool. Uh, and it's updated again to include the most recent sea level rise scenarios that have been, uh, put out by the national climate assessment and incorporated in the, in the work by the Maine climate council. Another good one is, um, uh, put together by our partners over at the nature conservancy. Uh, it's called the Coastal Risk Explorer, um, and you can actually look at a variety of different things, including marsh migration and things, but the sea level rise scenarios haven't quite caught up. It uses uh, some older sea level rise scenarios, but that also includes some information on social vulnerability demographics um, and also impacts to roads. So you can actually zoom into the town you live in uh, and move a slider kind of up and down to different sea level rise scenarios, and it'll tell you how many miles of road and how estimate of how much it might cost it to handle, you know, the impacts to those roads and also give like a social social vulnerability rating uh, in terms of demographics. So it gets a little bit more into the human side of things. Our next question is with high tides trending higher in depth, or is it logical that low tides will not drain out as much? You know, could it ex affect things like the exposure of clam flats or harvesting clams, for instance? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that So a lot of our work kind of looks at the higher end of the tide scale, uh, tide level, and, and, and um, in terms of, you know, how nuisance flooding will increase and things like that. But it's very, very logical uh, to, to make that statement. Um, we do expect that because basically sea level rise is, you know, if you've got this curve that goes like this with the tides, just move that whole curve up because of sea level rise. It's basically superimposing the water level, you know, certain amount higher. So the tides we do expect to be going up about the same, but because it's superimposed on a higher water level, they will go up higher. Uh, and, and so one of the impacts will be that our lower tides will be a little bit higher as well. And the, from a biological standpoint, I'm not prepared to kind of give you an indication of what that's going to do to different shellfish habitat and things like that. But you would expect a mudflat that might be exposed uh, at low tide right now that in the future, uh, it might not be exposed. There might be water on it at all times. So that might lead to a shift in the kind of shellfish that use those flats. Can future governors disband Maine's Climate Council? Uh, one attendee's fear was in a fear of her students as well, is that all the good work done by Maine Climate Council could be undone with one election, thereby making youth that are on the cusp of being voters, but aren't quite there yet, feeling helpless and hopeless. So when the Maine Climate Council was created, it was created by law. So the legislature passed a law that created the Maine Climate Council. And that law created it in perpetuity. And every four years, there, there's a shift in the membership um, of the Climate Council and its working groups and science and technical subcommittee and they're tasked with having an updated plan. So for the Climate Council to be disbanded, it would be a legislative function. 
So it would have to go back to the legislature and, um, and, and, and seek to change the law that the legislature put into effect. What is the proposed approach to help local governments relocate or otherwise protect wastewater treatment plants from sea level rise? I could tackle part of that one, and then I, if you have something to add, go for it. Um, so I, the, I, I would say the first approach really is to, to kind of conduct vulnerability assessments. And we've done a couple of pilot projects um, in Booth Bay Harbor and Wiscasset that uh, are very transferable. So they look at certain um, standards for wastewater treatment plants that are well over and above what standards for other kinds of infrastructure are and then look at sea level on top of that uh, and look at what's vulnerable and then how you would adapt pieces of infrastructure and how much that might cost. Um, from the state side, in terms of some funding to support that stuff, Maine DEP it does offer, they have several different programs. There's a state municipal wastewater grant program um, that can help with uh, improvements to wastewater treatment plants. And there's also a Maine Clean, uh, Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, there's a loan program uh, that actually will forgive, give for, principal forgiveness up to $20,000 um, for loans that are taken out under this, through this program to actually pursue wastewater treatment plant adaptation and resiliency. Um, and you can just Google those programs to find out more information from Maine DEP. I think to build upon that, one of the primary needs and recommendations that came out of the working groups was that the state needs to provide technical assistance to the municipalities um, who are on the front lines of making these decisions. So there were very strong recommendations to have um, information exchanges where data is available and technical assistance from the state, similar to what Pete was just talking about, where, where you have state experts working with municipalities. There was also a real need, uh, a, an identified need, both on a state and municipal level, that there isn't enough money right now to do this work. Like the funds that Pete referenced, there is such a backlog of upgrades to happen at wastewater treatment facilities up and down the coast um, that is unmet. So another big need that was identified was having a clearinghouse for funding sources and having a real state effort to try to identify more funding sources, whether it's federal money um, or grants uh, outside programs that will help municipalities with identifying needs and the adaptation decisions that need to be made for our coastal towns to be resilient. Well, it's really for the whole state to be resilient, but we're focused on um, coastal communities with our with our sea level rise and storm surge discussions. So we were just talking about some of um, the financial concerns around this work. So there's another question that relates to that. Um, in this person commented, if we don't do anything, there's going to be a negative economic impact. Will that cost us more um, than it would cost to adapt to the upcoming changes, right? None of this is gonna happen without that adequate state funding and staffing to lead um, and then rise to this challenge. So, you know, what's the benefits of doing this work now rather than deal with the consequences of not making these changes? So then I mean, that's a great question. I mean, economics are a driving factor for a lot of this and, and that wasn't lost on the, on the efforts of the Climate Council. Um, there was a, a ERG, which is a consultant, uh, an economic consultant was brought in to look at exactly those questions. Uh, and on the Maine Climate Council's reports website, um, there is a, uh, a whole series of reports that were that got at that question of what's the cost benefit of doing nothing, um, what's the potential costs for adaptation, for mitigation, and things like that. Uh, and the reports kind of titled the assess uh, assessing the impacts of climate uh, assessing the impacts climate change may have on the state's economy, revenues, and investment decisions. And again, there's a series of reports um, that look at that no action alternative all the way up to the costs of actually mitigating greenhouse gases. So uh, it's certainly something that wasn't lost on the Climate Council. Um, 
and, and is a very, very important driver of the decisions that need to be made? Um, I think on a very broad or higher abstract level than that, just think about the cost of Superstorm Sandy or just what happened in Texas or all of these environmental crises that we have been having as a nation and, and, and the, the billions and billions of dollars and displacement and psychological tolls, uh, personal tolls it's had on people. And it, it, it just becomes clear as a matter of policy that it's, it's better to act in a preventative way, just like it's better to act with your health in a preventative way than to get so diseased and so damaged that you can't you, you either can't fix the problem, there's no amount of money that's going to do it, or it, it becomes so expensive, it's, it's prohibitive. Like how many times can you just rebuild along the coast without raising things, setting them back? The other thing about the economics that the, the question alludes to is the economics will inform decisions that municipalities make, right? So Portland that has a stormwater utility fee might make a difference might come up with a different solution, shall we say, than uh, Lubeck in terms of addressing a problem. Every community will have to look at its resources, its economics, what grants it can get, and what works for the problems in that particular community um, within the finances that they have. Can I kind of one more thing on the financial piece, because that's that's the wild card here, right? It's always great to have a plan and, and all of this, but the money is 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 a real problem, and. Um, I know that the infrastructure package that is being put together at a federal level and uh, will be considered in Congress anticipates that the, the, the funding to go to states and municipalities, I haven't details yet, I can't really talk about specifics, but it's intended to um, help with climate ready infrastructure, with funding that kind of work. So. We don't have all the answers, but it's better to have a really good plan and really good recommended action items and then try to work to find the money or, or, or try to support, you know, think ways that we may be able to get money at, from a federal level into the state to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, someone asked, given that Maine's greenhouse gas emissions are about three tenths of a percent of the nation's. Uh, isn't it critical that we support national mitigation pol policies? We just start with yes. <laughs> Pete, if you want to go first, I can do cleanup again. Uh, I mean, I don't really, I mean, yeah, it, it's vitally important. Um, I mean, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's such a small, Maine is such a small percentage. I mean, every, every portion helps, but and it also helps to, you know, maybe be kind of at, at, the, at the head of the curve um, so other states can kind of see what's been going on and what, what Maine might be doing uh, instead of Maine sitting back and waiting for other states to do something. So uh, I think setting a precedent is always good. But yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. It, there needs to be a lot, a lot more done from a mitigation standpoint um, at the entire national federal level. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that I think the Biden administration is certainly more uh, pretty interested in pursuing, it seems like. Um, so whether or not we get there is uh, is going to be is going to be interesting to see. But, um, you know, rejoining the climate accords and things like that and setting some goals for the country, I think, are very, very vitally important uh, for dealing with this issue, because um, at least from a sea level rise standpoint, which is one of the things I'm always interested in, we're, we're baked into a certain amount of sea level rise already. Uh, it doesn't matter what we do right now with, we could stop all emissions right now, sea levels will continue to rise uh, yeah. for, for a period of time. So how much it actually rises in the long run, we can have some control over. Uh, but it's a vitally important question. And I mean, yeah, the answer is yes. So I, uh, I'll again sort of bring it up to the, the bigger level. Um, you know, we're friends of Casco Bay. We realize that no one can do this alone and that we rely on so many other people for solutions. And that's part of the, uh, the real benefit of the um, Mills administration's approach to climate change. So when Governor Mills introduced the bill that the legislature passed to create the Climate Council and to set ambitious goals to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, she did it as part of 26 states working <laughs> to achieve goals. So it is true that we can't, um, we can't solve this problem on our own. So 
that's, that is a very thoughtful approach that it is done in collaboration and conjunction with other states. Similarly, um, the way that Maine has worked to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, um, there's an example called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And that was a group of North Atlantic states that sort of banded together and all the, the governors came to agreements to collectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the um, electric industry and then to use the credits from that to, to fund weatherization and other things that, that make our, our houses more uh, efficient or energy efficient. And now there's an effort called TCI, the Transportation Collaborative Initiative, that's the, the same band of states. Um, and Maine is not, it's, it's involved in it, it hasn't signed on to the agreement yet, but it's doing the same thing. It's saying, how can we set policy on a regional level? This is really important for a state like Maine when most of our transportation is like trucks coming through from Canada or people coming up from Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut and places for vacation land. So the TCI initiative has some real legs and real value because it's taking out a regional approach to um, how do we reduce our transportation footprint, which is the biggest area that we will be the next challenge for Maine to reduce our um, greenhouse gas emissions from. So both REGI on the electricity side and TCI on the um, transportation side are two great policies. And there's many others. I know that I, I heard from so many people um, after the program uh, why we didn't focus on mitigation. This talk was on sea level rise, storm surges, and more intense storms. And so we were really focusing on remediation. These examples that I'm just giving are, are part of the puzzle. We know that there are many other solutions out there to mitigation. And so the simple answer to this, to this question is yes, we need to do a lot more. And yes, we need to be involved at a federal and regional level because we can't protect Casco Bay without that. Updating zoning regulations and design gui guidelines every four years, you know, starting immediately, right, will seems fa fairly challenging in terms of resources and capacity. Can either of you speak to that a little bit? I think the intent is not that everything gets updated every four years, but if you have, for example, in your zoning, a sea level rise overlay and four years from now, our understanding advances that we don't need to plan for 3.9 levels of, you know, feet of sea level rise, but, but for six, or wow, if we're really great at doing, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions for less, then, then you adjust the science, you adjust what's in there just mechanically. You don't redo all of your zoning or all of your plan, you, or all of the state regulations, you just make sure that the science is accurate. Pete's example about the sand dune regulations, it has two feet of sea level rise. That needs to be adjusted now that the science is better. That doesn't require an entire rewrite if we have the right mechanism in place to adjust our scientific assumptions. Pete, you wanna? Yeah, I, I think you pretty much nailed it. Um, I think one of the key points in that is, is we need to make our regulations and the things that govern our natural resources, the things we're trying to protect, you know, and, and our development planning and things like that, a little bit more dynamic uh, in terms of the ability to be able to adapt uh, to the changing science. Um, you know, for instance, the coastal sand dune rules we rewrote in 2004 to 2006, a two year process. And at the time, you know, two feet of sea level rise was considered to be by over the next hundred years to be a pretty logical thing to, to plan for. Um, but it, it, the way, the way rules are, are set up, it's very difficult to actually go in and change just a little, little snippet of rules. You, you can open them up to a whole bunch of changes and things like that. And, um, that isn't necessarily the best way of doing things. So I think the, I mean, I think the, the way that the language was written was so that every four years, especially from a sea level rise understanding and scenario planning standpoint, um, we've kind of tied the work we do to what comes out of the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which is always uh, released basically in every four years. Um, so every you know every four years we get uh, updated numbers in terms of those scenarios, better understanding of the science, um, 
So we're not saying you have to open up all your regs uh, every four years. I mean, right now it only it mains regulations. Coastal sanding rules is the only spot that really mentions or deals with sea level rise. So we need to make the changes in the other regulations that govern activities in systems that are going to be impacted by sea level rise. But just because you open them up once doesn't mean you're going to have to open them up necessarily every four years. Um, but again, that gets back to the point where they should be written in a way that the language is very specific so that you are revisiting certain aspects of those regulations on a fairly regular interval. And you don't have to open up the entire set of regulations for potentially, you know, making them less effective at what they're trying to do. Um, so a couple, couple different points there. Is there anything else you want to make sure folks know about sea level rise storms and surges? One of the important things to remember is um, sea level is not something that's going to stop rising come the year 2100. You know, we've set that as a kind of a long term planning horizon goal. Um, but it's unrealistic from a scientific standpoint to think that it's simply going to stop rising. So I, I guess the one point that I would like to make is, is that uh, the generations coming after us need to be thinking about this issue. And we, just, we need to set this up so that it's easier for them to think about and deal with this issue um, because it's something that's going to continue to impact humanity. Uh, it's, you know, so some states have actually gone and started to incorporate language for planning out to 2150, for instance. Um, and that's something that Maine may want to consider at some point. Uh, you start to get into some pretty scary numbers when you start thinking out that far in advance. Um, but again, the point is, is that I don't want to be pessimistic, but we definitely don't think that it's just going to stop and start falling uh, come, come the year 2100. And I think the most important point is the abstracted science that Pete did present and, and understanding that these are projections based on best science by lots of smart people who've been collecting data and that the time to act is now, both to, to, to change our emission levels and to think about how to be resilient for the future. Like we, we needed to act yesterday and the day before, but uh, we can't. We just, I think the plan is titled so well, Maine can't wait to, to take action. So that's the, again, if I'm the person who's going back to the big picture level, that's, that's really the message that needs to be clear. Well, that leads right into our last question. And that is what can the citizens of Maine do? What should each person try to do at the very local and the statewide level? Well, I mean, uh, uh, basically what you said applies um, about action. Um, I, I think what a couple of the key key things that I think about here is is education, um, not only not only educating yourselves as coastal stakeholders um, on these issues, but also making sure that your local and state decision makers are educated on the issue. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where citizenry can really step in. Um, you know, the way our political system set up every two years, a new town council, for instance, comes in, uh, it, it might make sense to have climate change issues part of something that they hear about every two years when you get a new, when you get new members. Um, and I think, you know, so educating yourselves, your local and state decision makers is really, really important to create continuity on these issues, which is not something we just want to do for two years, then take a break. Uh, and then come back another four years from now and talk about and then take a break. It should be part of our daily conversations um, and, and part of our annual goals as a state. And I think, you know, being an advocate for the changes that you see that are that are important uh, is, is really, really important. You know, if we just sit back and take things in and listen and not talk about them or not push certain agendas or things that we're really interested in, um, changes don't occur. So education and then being active on, on the things that you care about are really important, I think. So yeah, absolutely. Make your voice heard, get educated, keep asking the amazing questions like you're asking because that allows us all to go deeper into conversation and to further all of our understanding. Get involved. 
um, I was taking a look at climate um, action plans, municipal climate action plans, and they are done by <laughs> committees of volunteers. Like there are so many amazing people out there with different backgrounds or expertise, and that's the way things get done in, in Maine in particular. So get involved, go see if your town has a climate action plan. Is it complete? Is it everything that the town needs? If not, um, can, can you help your town get started with a process to take further action? If your town doesn't have a plan, can you help your town with a plan? Um, and I, I do think the Maine Won't Wait plan is, is now a catalyst for more municipalities taking action because they can see what the outline is for action. Um, as I said during the, um, the presentation that we gave, we'll send you out emails. We will keep you informed. And if you want even more information, let us know. We will be happy to provide more. Uh, you can sign up for the Maine Climate Council updates. They're really excellent and informative and, and list things going on um, around the state and also give an update on legislation coming up related to climate action. Talk to your local representatives and senators. And there's a lot of care in our state um, legislature for these issues. And there are, there, are, there are good people who want to hear from their constituents. So let them know your thoughts. Um, those are, you can become a water reporter. You can help us document um, these changes. That's really invaluable because to have people who are documenting particularly the people who, who, are, who help us with one area or if we're saying, oh, there's gonna be king tides or a major storm and you can get out and help us document conditions around the bay. That's really helpful to understanding because we, we can't be um, everywhere at once. So there's so much you can do that um, it's almost like you can't do nothing. <laughs> just Just take actions across the board and we'll all be part of the solution. Well, Pete and Ivy, thank you so much for taking this extra time so that we could answer everyone's questions and uh, just really appreciate you both sharing your knowledge and your insights and uh, with all of us so we can all learn together. Thanks. Definitely. Welcome. Welcome.